World War II has many endings. For some, it ended in a Berlin bunker. For others, it happened when a formal declaration of surrender was signed in France. Even after these events, World War II continued to rage on in the Pacific, until a final ceremony was held aboard a battleship in Tokyo Bay. The craziest part is that World War II didn't actually end for several more years after these events for some people. In official documents and textbooks, two major events signaled the end of World War II. But what actually caused the Axis powers to finally give in to demands of the Allies? World War II started on September 1, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. The war was officially declared over six years and one day after this event on September 2, 1945. During this span, approximately 3% of the world's population would be lost. For many in Europe and the surrounding region, the official end of the war came when Germany was defeated. This was because European countries had fewer resources and men in the Pacific theater, and therefore were much more focused on the war at home. The United States and countries in East Asia, on the other hand, would continue fighting World War II for many more months. So for all intents and purposes, World War II actually came to an end for different parts of the world at different times. Obviously, the end of the war for Hitler happened when he shot himself in the Fuhrer bunker, and even so, the fighting in Europe would continue for several more days. But how did the Axis powers find themselves in this predicament? Germany had swept across and held most of Europe for three years without much of a problem. It was a series of big mistakes that would lead to the end of the Third Reich and the war in Europe. The beginning of the downfall for the Axis powers in Europe happened when Germany decided to invade the Soviet Union and fight a war on two fronts. Hitler thought that he could easily overpower the Soviets and then focus his attention on the rest of the Allied forces to the west, but that was not the case. As the Soviets retreated deeper and deeper into the frigid homeland, the Axis powers were spread thin. The brutal climate, lack of food, and the Soviets' scorched earth policy led them to successfully repel the Axis forces. The scorched earth tactic utilized by the Soviets was to salt their fields so nothing would grow burn down bridges and destroy any factories or buildings they thought would be useful to the enemy's advance. This led to the complete destruction of Soviet lands, towns, and cities by their own hands, but kept the Axis soldiers from getting a foothold in their country. While Hitler had his forces split on two fronts, the Allies invaded Sicily from the Mediterranean and proceeded into southern Italy. There, they defeated the fascist Italian forces, causing the front to collapse, eventually leading to the capture and death of Benito Mussolini at the hands of the communist partisans. Then, on June 6, 1944, the beginning of the end of the war in Europe was put into motion when the D-Day invasion of Normandy was carried out. Allied forces now had troops in northern France. It was in 1944 that the tides of World War II changed. However, there was still a long way to go before victory would be declared. Before the final nail could be put in the Axis coffin, one vicious battle needed to take place. This came to be known as the Battle of the Bulge. Germany had one way out of defeat, and that was to break the Allied lines on one of the fronts. Hitler and the Nazi regime were being squeezed into smaller and smaller territory by the Soviets advancing from the east and the rest of the Allied forces advancing from the west. The remaining Axis forces were caught in the middle of a balloon that was about to pop. Hitler decided that the best course of action would be to try and break through the Western Front. If all went according to plan, he would split the Allied line, meaning he could maneuver his troops out of the predicament they were in. This would allow Germany a way to secure more resources and fend off the rest of the Allied forces advancing from the Western Front. On December 16, 1944, the Nazis launched their surprise attack through the Ardennes Forest in Belgium and Luxembourg. This offensive spanned around 80 miles and consisted of some of the fiercest fighting of the war. As the Nazi forces slammed into the Allied lines, they began to bulge hence where the name came from. But they couldn't break through the enemy's lines. The Allies were able to repel the attack after attack carried out by the Axis tanks, soldiers, and the Luftwaffe. Unfortunately, the Nazis were not the only adversaries the Allies had to contend with. During the battle, the temperatures reached freezing conditions, leading to many soldiers developing frostbite and hypothermia. By the end of the battle, the Allies lost close to 75,000 men, but were able to hold the line. On the other hand, Germany lost between 80,000 and 100,000 men and were all but helpless against the advance of the Soviet army coming from the east. The Battle of the Bulge was the last chance for Germany to turn the tides of the war back in their favor, and they failed. The Soviets launched their winter offensive, which brought them within 50 miles of Berlin. It was at this point the war in Europe was just about over. There was no hope left for Germany and its allies in Europe. So, what actually ended World War II in Europe? Was it the death of Hitler? The answer to this question is no. 
The crazy thing is that there are two conflicting dates for the end of the Second World War on the European continent, it just depends on who you ask. Before the final surrender by Germany occurred, one final massacre took place. This came to be known as the firebombing of Dresden, which happened on February 13, 1945. This event killed thousands of civilians in one of the most horrific bombing campaigns of the entire war. The German lines were pushed further and further back toward Berlin as the weeks progressed. Hitler saw the end coming, and rather than being tried and sentenced for the atrocities he committed in his concentration camps and across Europe, he decided to take his own life like the coward that he was. This left the remaining leaders of the Nazi party to answer for what they'd done. The man with most of the decision-making power after Hitler's death was Grand Admiral Karl Donitz. On May 7, 1945, he started peace talks with the Allies. Although Donitz seemed to have an ulterior motive besides just unconditional surrender, as the Soviet war machine marched toward Berlin, destroying everything in their path, Donitz hoped he could use the time until the peace talks to evacuate as many Germans out of the path of the Soviets as possible. To be fair, the Russians were brutal to any Nazi sympathizers they came across, as they would not soon forget the brutality their homeland faced as German troops marched across the country. Donitz also hoped that he could turn the US, British, and French against the Soviet Union, and perhaps even put the Allied powers at war with one another. However, all Donitz really accomplished was ordering General Alfred Jodl to sign the unconditional surrender of the Axis powers in Europe, effective the following day. At this point, the Allied forces ran into a problem. Joseph Stalin refused to accept the surrender by Jodl that was seen over by General Dwight D. Eisenhower and Rolls France. The rationale for this was threefold. The first reason was that since the Soviets had lost the most men of any Allied power, they should oversee the surrender. The second reason was that Stalin felt like the surrender should happen in the enemy capital of Berlin. And the third reason, and the most likely for why Stalin objected to the signing in France, was that there was no Soviet diplomat present at the peace talks. Therefore, Stalin had the Germans sign a second declaration of surrender in Karlshorst, which was a suburb of Berlin. It was there that Soviet Marshal Georgi Zhukov oversaw the surrender of the Germans. This happened on May 8th, but the Nazis asked for 12 hours to ensure that all of their troops received the order that there was to be a ceasefire and no unintentional conflicts broke out. The Soviets agreed, but only verbally. However, by the time everything was settled, it was May 9th. This resulted in two different dates for the end of World War II in Europe. The first was on May 8th, 1945, with the surrender in France under the watch of Eisenhower, and the second was in Berlin on May 9th, 1945, observed by Zhukov. So, if asked when World War II actually ended in Europe, the answer is a little tricky. It just depends on who you ask. Even though the fighting in Europe was over, there was still a war raging on in the Pacific. In that part of the world, Japan and the Allied forces battled on land, in the air, and at sea. Unfortunately, the end of this part of World War II would end in nuclear explosions, the destruction of entire cities, and the loss of unfathomable amounts of life. The war in the Pacific had a different start date than the one in Europe. On September 27, 1940, the Tripartite Pact was signed in Berlin by Germany, Italy, and Japan. This agreement stated that if any of the three nations were attacked by another nation not already in the war, the others would provide assistance. This alliance was used as a deterrent to keep the United States on the sidelines and out of the war. The Tripartite Pact also recognized that at the end of World War II, if the Axis powers were victorious, Germany would control Europe and the surrounding region, while Japan would be the rulers of East Asia and into the Pacific. Tensions between the United States and Japan had been growing since the US had imposed sanctions on Japan to slow its expansion and economic growth. Even though the Tripartite Pact was put into place to stop other countries from aiding the Allied powers, things went sideways with one event. A single decision by Japan would eventually lead to their downfall and the very end of World War II. Japan couldn't expect the rest of the world to take them seriously if they allowed the United States to slow their expansion goals. However, Japan also knew that if they went to war with the US, it was going to be a difficult fight to win. There was a chance that Japan could be victorious without much help from Germany and Italy, as long as they could use the element of surprise to destroy the United States Pacific Fleet in a single attack. They chose to do this through the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The Japanese knew that if they could catch the US Pacific Fleet at dock, they could use their bombers to destroy most of the ships. Unfortunately, not everything went as planned and several key vessels in the fleet, including all of its aircraft carriers, were out at sea. Unknown to Japanese intelligence, these ships had been delayed due to bad weather and would not be back at Pearl Harbor for several days. It was just a matter of dumb luck that the carriers were not back when the Japanese attacked. This event would also be one of the key factors that would lead to the end of World War II. There is no doubt that the attack on Pearl Harbor was a devastating blow to the US Navy. 
but the Japanese had failed to complete their main objective, the complete destruction of the Pacific Fleet. This, along with missing key targets such as fueling facilities and repair docks, allowed the United States to repair several ships, refuel the carriers, and launch a world of hurt on the Japanese forces in the Pacific. Pearl Harbor also caused the United States to join the Allies in Europe, which was one of the critical factors that allowed the Allies to eventually declare victory in that part of the world. Looking back at the war, Pearl Harbor might have been the decisive turning point that eventually led to the actual end of World War II. If Japan had not provoked the US to enter the war by bombing the fleet, Germany might have been able to win Europe. Japan would have also likely been able to hold their own in the Pacific, and once Germany and Italy controlled their region of the world, they could have provided more resources for Japan to conquer the rest of Asia and the South Pacific. However, the fact that the United States joined the World War II as a result of the attack on Pearl Harbor meant the Axis powers now had another powerful military to fight against. Japan now found itself in a desperate position. US forces were closing in on all sides. The final major battle in the Pacific Theater was the Battle of Okinawa. The United States planned to take the island of Okinawa and use it to launch bombing runs and an invasion force into the main island of Japan. On April 1, 1945, over 60,000 US soldiers landed on the beaches of Okinawa. They fought Japanese forces for almost three months before finally securing victory, but at a great cost. The island's dense forests and harsh volcanic landscape made securing it difficult. This also gave Japanese soldiers an advantage because they had the home ground advantage, which allowed them to set booby traps and ambush US soldiers. After the battle was over, the United States had lost around 12,000 men. 90,000 Japanese troops were killed in the battle as well. However, the most tragic part was that 100,000 civilians died as a result of the fighting between the Americans and Japanese for this strategic piece of land. After the loss of Okinawa, Japanese leaders knew their chance of winning the war in the Pacific was almost zero, but they refused to give up and started preparing for the invasion of their island. However, the invasion would never come as what would happen next prompted the surrender of Japan and the official end of World War II in the Pacific. When US military strategists concluded an invasion of Japan would cost somewhere in the range of 1 million soldiers' lives, they decided to try a different way to end the war. The US brought in their newest and most deadly weapon yet, the atomic bomb. Only weeks after the first successful test of an atomic bomb on July 16, 1945 in Alamo Gordo, New Mexico, President Truman gave the go-ahead to use the destructive weapon on Japan. It was August 6 when the B-29 bomber named Enola Gay took off from the Mariana Islands. The bomber flew over mainland Japan and dropped the first atomic bomb as a way to destroy the manufacturing city of Hiroshima. However, due to its immense power, the explosion also killed somewhere between 70 and 120,000 people. This does not include the people who died later on from radiation poisoning and other complications due to the blast. When Japan did not surrender immediately, the boxcar was sent to drop a second atomic bomb in the Japanese city of Nagasaki. This bomb was actually more powerful than the first and killed somewhere between 50 and 80,000 people. The morality of dropping two atomic bombs on cities where the number of civilian casualties was known to be in the tens of thousands can be debated. Regardless, these two massacres did eventually lead to the surrender of Japan. One of the things that made this operation especially messed up was the fact that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were chosen as targets not because they had the most military significance, but because they hadn't been bombed extensively before. This was done to ensure the bombs did the most damage possible and optimize their efficiency. Unfortunately, as these cities were still pretty much intact and hadn't been bombed yet, there were still a lot of people living in them. Yes, this allowed the bombs to cause the destruction of military manufacturing facilities and eliminate enemy soldiers, but it also led to the deaths of countless innocent people as well. But something even crazier happened between the dropping of the first atomic bomb and the second one, an event that also contributed to the unconditional surrender of Japan that's not quite as well known. On August 8, 1945, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and invaded Manchuria. This meant that not only were the Japanese soldiers being obliterated on the island in the Pacific, but the Red Army was marching their way through China and slaughtering any enemy soldiers they came across. Japan was already struggling to fend off the United States, and there was no way the country would succeed in also fighting the Soviets. The fact that Manchuria was on the mainland and many soldiers had already been brought back to Japan to fight off the imminent American invasion meant there was literally nothing Japan could do to hold their territories on the continent of Asia. Between the atomic bombs and the Soviet invasion, Emperor Hirohito of Japan announced that the country would be surrendering on August 15, 1945. It would take a couple of more weeks for word to spread and preparations to be made for the formal surrender of Japan and the official end of World War II in the Pacific. 
On September 2nd, General Douglas MacArthur formally acknowledged Japan's surrender, which was signed by Foreign Affairs Minister Mamoru Shigemitsu on board the U.S. Missouri. The battleship was anchored in Tokyo Bay and surrounded by over 250 Allied ships. From the start of World War II when Hitler invaded Poland to the surrender ceremony aboard the U.S. Missouri, a total of 2,194 days had passed. It was the bloodiest war the world had ever seen in its history. Japan's surrender marked the official end to World War II around the world. Now everyone could move on from the atrocities and devastation of the previous years. Or could they? The craziest part about how World War II actually ended was that for some the war continued on, even after September 2nd. In the Philippines, there was a group of Japanese soldiers that refused to believe the war had ended. One man, named Hiro Unoda, was 23 years old when he was deployed to the Philippines to fight off the advancing American soldiers in 1944. He was in a squad with three other men, and all four of them believed that the reports of Japan surrendering were just propaganda to trick them into turning themselves over to the enemy. For years after the formal surrender of Japan, these men attacked Filipinos because they thought they were still fighting in World War II. This went on until about 1950, when one of the soldiers finally turned himself in and learned the truth about what had actually happened five years earlier. But Onoda and the other two soldiers refused to give up. It wasn't until 1972 that the Filipino police shot two of the Japanese soldiers, ending their delusions of fighting a war that ended 25 years earlier. This left Onoda as the only holdout left. In 1974, a Japanese tourist came into contact with Onoda and talked some sense into him. However, it wasn't until one of Onoda's former commanding officers came with a group of other military personnel that Onoda officially surrendered and returned home from the Philippines as a very confused retired soldier. He had been fighting World War II for almost 30 years after it had officially ended. And this wasn't just an isolated incident. Other Japanese soldiers who were spread out across the Pacific never received word that the war had ended. They continued to fight, not believing for a second that Japan would ever surrender, let alone lose the war. The last orders these soldiers were given was to fight until the bitter end no matter what. They were so devoted to the emperor that they would gladly lay down their lives for their country, and the thought of surrender never even crossed their minds. This just goes to show that the end of World War II did not happen at the same time for everyone. Tragically, some of the last people to be given their lives back after World War II were held captive by the United States. Although the war officially ended on September 2, 1945, Japanese internment camps in the United States did not close until March 1946. This was almost half a year after the Allies celebrated victory over Japan and the rest of the world received word that World War II was over. Yet 120,000 people who were of Japanese heritage were still kept in internment camps long after the war was declared over. For these people, World War II did not end in 1945. In fact, the last internment camp finally closed on March 20, 1946. And even after these innocent people were released from what can only be described as prison, they were often mistreated by other Americans for how they looked or where their family was from. It would be more apt to say that World War II for Japanese Americans did not end for several years or even decades after 1945, as they were still persecuted in many areas. This is the sad truth about what war does to people. During World War II, there was no population of people treated more horribly than the Jews. For many, the atrocities of the war would never be forgotten. World War II would be part of them for their entire lives as they suffered from PTSD and other afflictions caused by the Nazis and their allies. It's important to remember that even until this day, the horrors of World War II are ingrained in the psyches of many in the Jewish community. Even when the fighting stopped, there was still a long road to recovery for many people. United States soldiers who fought for years in the war did not actually get to experience the end of World War II for many months after the surrender of Japan. The soldiers wanted to return home now that the fighting was over. This wasn't an unreasonable request. However, many were required to stay abroad and oversee the transitions to new governments and to ensure that the peace treaties were enforced. Soldiers in the Pacific got so angry with being ignored by their representatives that they came up with the slogan, No Boats, No Votes. This would be written or stamped on letters sent back to the United States as a way to remind those in the government that if they weren't allowed to return home soon, there would be hell to pay in the next election cycle. Things got so bad that U.S. soldiers started to hold protests against their own government. On Christmas Day in Manila, around 4,000 American soldiers held a mass demonstration to bring attention to their cause. They wanted to go home, and if the government wasn't going to bring them back, they were going to cause trouble. And this wasn't the only example of protests occurring. Demonstrations in London, Paris, and Frankfurt all carried the same battle cry. Some saw this as a form of mutiny. So the stranded soldiers had done their duty during World War II and risked their lives. It didn't seem like too much to ask to be brought home. 
The soldiers eventually did get back to the US, but many did not consider the war over until their boots were back on American soil. Officially, there are three different days that World War II ended. For many Europeans, the war was over on May 8th and is celebrated as Victory in Europe Day or VE Day. However, in Russia and Eastern Europe, some maintain that the official end of World War II happened on May 9th, when the Germans surrendered to the Soviets just outside of Berlin. For some countries in East Asia and the United States, the end of World War II didn't occur until September 2, 1945, when the Japanese officials signed the documents at the surrender ceremony aboard the U.S. Missouri. This became known as Victory Over Japan Day or VJ Day. However, for many, World War II continued on even after the Axis powers' surrender in Europe and Asia. Now watch Most Terrifying Weapons of World War II.